letting me speak with your class today. Um, I am sorry, y'all, that I cannot be there in person. I am currently in North Carolina. I'm a first year student at Duke University, and I'm actually a, a used to be a student of HISD. So that's why, you know, my hometown is Houston, and I, I really wish that I could have um, been there to actually connect with you guys um, on a more face to face type of thing. But you know, what can we do in the age of COVID and also when we're in two different states. Uh, so this will just have to make do for now. But um, just to kind of give you guys a, establish a little bit of credibility and give you a little bit of information about who I am before we jump into today's topic. Um, like I said, my name is McKinsey. I graduated from high school in 2019. So I was class of 2019 from Carnegie Vanguard. I graduated salutatorian of my class. Um, I actually graduated high school at 16 years old and so I'm 18 now. Um, and so you're probably like, huh, you said you were first year at Duke, you graduated at 16. Like there's kind of a, a big age gap in there. Like what's going on? So I actually took a gap year uh, when I graduated from high school. Um, and so that's what I did kind of during the entirety of um, that, that August or like whenever I got out to graduate in June 2019 up until August um, 2020 of this year. And one of the I did quite a I did a lot of different things during my gap year. But one of the things I'm really most proud of and most passionate about is I founded a nonprofit called Mac School Prep. Um, and if you guys want to take this down, um, it's school S C H O O L P R E P dot com. So Mac school prep dot com. And so basically what that um, is, is you it'll take you right to my website. Um, and I also have a, a YouTube channel. You can access my YouTube channel from the website. And it's all about just various um, academic strategies that will enable you to put your best foot forward in the classroom. And Ms. Carp, before I continue, let me ask you this. Um, what grade level am I speaking to today? These are all 12th graders. Okay, all seniors. Awesome. Um, so, you know, some of the stuff that you guys will probably find most helpful is I have information about actually, you know, applying for scholarships. You know, you're still kind of in the midst of applying to college. So I encourage you guys to look at my um, information about um, how to actually craft strong essays. I was, aside from Duke, I was admitted into 13 other highly selected universities, um, Rice, University of Virginia, Vanderbilt, Johns Hopkins, UT Austin Honors Program, um, Emory, Wash U, so a, a whole plethora of schools. And so I kind of know what it takes to be successful during the college application process. And so I encourage you guys to, to check, it, check that as well. Um, but some other stuff that you just might find helpful that I think is applicable to really um, any academic setting you're in, you're never too old um, to, to know this information would be just like what it actually means to study, what it means to learn, what it means to network, um, you know, just vital things like that that will uh, enable and, and, and permit your success really in any academic environment and also in a professional environment as well. I just encourage you guys to, to look into that. So um, without further ado, uh, and and I, I'm going to leave some time at the end for any questions that you got, my guys might have about just like my journey up until this point, my experience in college or, or anything like that. I'll leave some time at the end. But for today's purpose, I kind of wanted to um, align my content with what you guys are covering um, in this course right now. And I believe Ms. Carp shared with me that you guys are focusing a lot on communication and what all goes into that and why it is so essential, not just um, in an academic environment, but as you as you think more broadly about entering the workforce in a, in a professional environment. So as as hard as it will be to, to encourage participation in this very weird like Microsoft Teams virtual sort of setting, I do want to, to hear from you guys. And so um, before we dive in, I does anybody want to kind of offer or multiple people? What is communication to you? Like, what does that what does that mean? Just feel free to to jump in, unmute yourself. I don't really think I can like tell if you're like raising your hand. So just um, communication to me is when you um, express how you feel to another person. Yes, awesome. That was a great definition. Anybody else? Okay. 
Okay, just wanted to just wanted to leave it open there. All right, that was good. I appreciate you sharing that. So yeah, basically communication is a form of expression. Um, and it is not something that's universally human. You know, animals have communication between other animals, between human and animals. Um, but one of the things I really, really want you guys kind of as a, as a take home point today is that communication isn't just about talking, right? Communication entails written expression, right? When we're submitting an essay on our behalf, whether we're writing an email or a letter um, or, you know, some type of formal essay that we submitted on uh, to the SAT or ACT test. Those are written forms of communication. We have verbal forms of communication like I'm doing right now when I'm talking to you guys, when I'm presenting. Um, and then there's also another form of communication that I think a lot of people take for granted, and that's body language, right? Whether you're making eye contact with somebody when you're talking to them or when you're listening to them, whether you're leaning in and, and showing that you're intently paying attention. We're going to get into all of those different types of communication today, but one of the reasons that communication is so, so important is because it is the way it allows people to form impressions about us, right? So whenever we're meeting somebody, you know, we're constantly sizing them up. We're, you know, we're trying to figure out, is this person somebody that I want to befriend? Is this person somebody that I can trust? Is this person somebody that maybe has more knowledge than me in XYZ arena and I want to network with them in some, in some way or another? So it's a way of reading people by the way that they're communicating with us. Um, communications are also important because kind of on this note of people forming impressions about us, the way we communicate gives people insight into our confidence, right? Whether we, you know, walk into a room and maybe we're not meant to be there, but we act like we know what we're doing. We talk like we know what we're doing. People aren't going to question our credibility at that point. So it shows, okay, this person is very confident. This person is maybe some sort of expert in what they're talking about, or they're pretending to be an expert. And I'm like, I, I, I can't tell otherwise, right? Um, so sometimes communication allows you to make it till you make it, so to speak. Um, communication also allows, like I said, about our credibility, our likability, all by the way that we are presenting ourselves. Um, so just to kind of recap that section, uh, communication is not just specific to articulate, articulately speaking and, and clearly expressing yourself, but it's also, um, it also encompasses active listening. That is a major component of communication that I also think people take for granted. And that means that when you're having a conversation or when somebody's trying to share information with you, like I'm doing right now, are you listening to the information or are you merely just hearing it? And I actually, this is, this is something that I love just like hearing people comment on. What do you guys think the difference is between listening and hearing can somebody um kind of jump in here and, and tell me what they think um i think the difference between hearing um and listening is that you hear like you can hear a sound right but, <laughs> but like that's the way you can hear a person right but when you're listening you're truly like paying attention and comprehending what they're saying andrea you couldn't have said it more beautifully that is actually spot on so hearing you hear noise right? That's something that just kind of goes in one ear and out the other. You don't really have to be consciously and actively paying attention to it and processing it and understanding that deeper meaning, right? So if you're just merely hearing what I'm saying right now, you probably wouldn't be able to repeat anything that I just said. I'm just background noise to whatever task that you're giving your undivided attention to versus if you're versus if you're listening to what I am saying, that means that you are really holding on to my every word. You're really trying to kind of grapple with that information inside of your head and make sense of it and figure out how can I apply this to, to my everyday experience. So there's that key difference between hearing and listening that I want you guys to, to take forward as you move into these, these next phases of your life and just make sure that you understand that that's also a part of, of communication. It allows communication to um, it facilitates communication, right? Because when you're when somebody can tell that you're really paying attention to what they're saying, they're more likely to to continue engaging. Um, so that is kind of just wanted to set the stage for what it means to communicate, why it's important. And now what I would like to transition into is something that you guys can maybe relate to a little bit more. You're experiencing this right now, and that is communication in the form of essays, more specifically college and 
scholarship essays. So want to hear from you guys. What has been the hardest part about kind of writing these essays for, for college? Let me just hear a little bit of feedback. Take me back to my senior year because that was a stressful time. So well, what are you guys' um, feelings about that? In my personal opinion, writing um, letters and essays to scholarships, I just mm -hmm. want to be able to stand out from what they're, whatever they're reading. Mm -hmm. Like, I understand mm -hmm. that they're going to get like thousands, maybe even millions of people mm -hmm. coming in. Mm -hmm. I want to be original, but I also don't want to take away from the topic that they gave us. Yeah, yeah, that's perfect. Destiny, you're definitely justified in, in how you feel. And I um, had that, I had a very similar experience. Other people want to jump in? Okay, that's okay. We'll have other opportunities, but so far I'm, I'm really happy with those of you who have participated. I appreciate your um, commentary and insight. So yeah, college and scholarship essays are really a way for these admissions committees, these application review committees to just get to know you beyond what your numbers indicate. And by numbers, I'm talking SAT score, ACT score, grades, right? That reveals kind of your academic and, and intellectual ability. But aside from that, we, we aren't just merely numbers, right? We, we want to be more than that. We're, you know, something that I'm um, learning about right now in school that I've found really fascinating. And, and this is a question that I want to ask you guys, and you don't have to answer. Um, but figuring out, are you a stat? Are you a statistic? Or are you a story, right? And that is what these essays are about, showing colleges showing these scholarship um admissions committees that you're more than just a, a statistic on a page you're you're human you are a story you have something that that makes you special that makes you unique that makes you human that makes you a person right and and the reason that these essays are so so vital it's so vital that you are clearly and, and expressing yourself to the best of your ability is because the thing is is you can't be in the room with these people when they're reading your um, when they're reading your essays. That essay has to carry the weight of a person. Has to actually it, it has to represent who you are to the fullest and almost make it seem like there's some three D um, conjuration of of you in the room because they can't talk to you. There's there's a different level of connection that can happen when you can hear somebody's voice or when you can see them versus just reading their words on a page. And so that's why the effort that you put into these essays is just so, so important because it has to show, it has to, to kind of give insight into, you know, what's your background? What are the perspectives that you're going to be bringing to the classroom and, and to extracurricular spaces? What drives you? What, what's that motivating force? Is that your family? Is that your own um, kind of internal inclinations? What makes you vulnerable, right? If, if you've ever been in an interview or something, these, um, the interviewers always, it's, it's a pretty common question for them to ask, you know, what's your weakness? What's a time where you felt really uncomfortable, where you didn't feel like you were, um, you know, it, you didn't feel confident for some reason? What are experiences that have that have shaped you and that have allowed you to become a, a stronger, more resilient person? These are all things that the essays are trying to tap into and that college admissions committees want to um, know about you, right? And so I wanted to, to share with you guys a little sniff test that that I've um, that I historically used when I was working on my scholarship essays and and working on my college admissions uh, essays. And that is that you press the submit button, you you turn it into Common App when you know two things that your essay is going to be compelling enough to, to pique your reader's interest. Say, oh, OK, this was this was a diff this was a, this kind of gave me a different feeling from all the other papers that have slid across my my desk today. This kind of woke me up. I was feeling tired, but this gave me energy. I'm like, wow, I, I, this, this is a really compelling story. Right. So that's that's part one of the sniff test. And then the part two of the sniff test is, is your essay are your words on the page going to give your reader this this undeniable urge to say yes? I want to meet this person right now in person. I want them in my office. I want them here on my campus. I want to give them this money. Do is that is that the urge that you give them just by the weight that your words are carrying, right? So that's kind of the sniff test that I've historically used um, kind of when 
when um, crafting my essay responses. Now, connecting this to communication, right? Because we don't want to lose sight of, of why we're here today and what I'm talking to you guys about. Now, every, you know, you've probably noticed this by now, but the, the word count that all of these essays, it's, it's pretty typical for them to have a word count, whether that's 250 words, whether that may be 33 words, um, 650 words. And, and the reason for that is that these people do not have time to be reading pages upon pages upon pages. They want you to be clear, concise, address their prompt, and they want every single one of your words to carry a powerful punch. Every word that you put on the page should be purposeful, right? And so what purpose do your words need to be serving? Well, a few things, right? Um, one of the, the one of the questions that you need to make sure that you're addressing doesn't matter the prompt, right? Obviously, you want to answer the prompt. You don't want to just be like they're asking you, "Hey, what's your favorite color?" and you're talking about, "Oh yeah, I love macaroni." Does doesn't make a lot of sense. That that dog's not going to hunt. Um, but something that you need to be weaving in to your essay while also addressing the question is, are you embodying the ideal applicant? Right? So Colleges, when they're reading your essays, they already have, you know, yeah, they, they want diversity on their campus, so on and so forth, but they have this, this ideal student that they know is going to be successful on their campus. What is that ideal student? Let me ask you guys, what do you think colleges are looking for when they're reading your, your, um, your applications? What, what is kind of that, that general thing, um, general characteristics that they know will enable somebody to be successful on a college campus? Um, maybe their leadership skills. Ding, bingo, bingo. Yes, other things. I would say they would look forward to viewing their goals in the essay. Say again. Their goals. So, kind of elaborate on that. What do you What do you mean by that? Because I think you're onto the right track, but I just want you to kind of explain. So, when they're reading those essays, they're going to look for your uh you know what you want to get done in your future a long way yeah your, that, that's your that's, career and what you're doing in college perfect perfect yes i figured that's what you were getting at but i just wanted to to hear you say it so yeah they want to make sure that you're that you're driven you have some sort of ambition some sort of um you know goal or aspiration or something that you want to accomplish um and so yeah those are those are great things i'm glad you guys mentioned those so yeah they they want to make sure that you have leadership abilities that you are somebody who is um service oriented that you have compassion for other humans right you you want to to give yourself your time your effort to to better somebody else's life experience they want to make sure that you are ambitious and and you have some sort of passion not meaning that hey i already know what i want to major in or hey i already know what kind of job i want to have but they want to make sure that you have a little bit of direction right they want you to be open-minded when you come to campus especially here at duke we we have this um you know my college advisor when i meet with them she always tells me that i'm a little bit too plan oriented and I have too much of my stuff laid out and I'm not leaving a lot of room open for exploration. But they, they want you to strike that balance between being somebody that, that is willing to explore and be open minded and have new experiences, but also somebody that's like, I'm working towards something. I wanna graduate with a degree at the end of this and potentially go to law school or med school or business school, so on and so forth. So are you embodying the ideal applicant to this college? Scholarships also have their own ideal applicant and it's gonna, there's some commonalities across all of them and there are also some differences. But what I encourage you to do, especially for scholarships, is go look at their website. Before you submit a scholarship um, essay or application, go look and see who are they giving money to? If they have profiles for um, the recipients of the award, go read them, say, okay, looks like some commonalities or that these people were all in leadership positions or these people all demonstrated immense creativity in, in founding some sort of organization or you know doing some sort of creative experience that's groundbreaking that's never been done before. Um, or you know, maybe they're looking for somebody that's you know done a certain amount of community service and has, you know, not necessarily gone to another country, but has done stuff maybe right there and locally, but they're trying to better their community in some way. So go look at the the um, the values that these scholarships and these colleges are looking for their students to possess. And those are the things that you need to be, and I wouldn't even say subtly weaving into your essays, I would say overtly weaving into your essays and demonstrating, hey, 
I'm a leader because of X, Y, Z, and weaving that into your experience in some sort of way so that the colleges have no doubt that you're, you know, meant to be on their campus. Um, another thing that I want you guys to, to remember is that when you are crafting the essays, you want to start writing them early. This goes into communication because when we are, when we initially start writing, you know, these essays and stuff, we kind of just spill our thoughts onto the page. We're just like, man, okay, I'm on a roll. Like, let me just get it out. And sometimes we, we bang out the essay maybe in, in, in one go, right? But when we take a break from it, we leave, maybe we come back in a few days, our perspective changes a little bit and we can make things a little bit more concise. We can clean things up. We can change our wording, make things more interesting, add an adjective here, add some figurative language there, right? So leaving, uh, starting your essays early allows you to have time to go back and refine the way that you are expressing yourself and enhance the way that you are communicating. It also allows you to leave time available for people to proofread your essays, right? And so what's the purpose of having somebody to proofread your essay? Um, I think a lot of people go wrong in thinking that, hey, like I'm gonna have my mom and my dad like proofread this and kind of just write my essay for me. No, that is not the point, right? One of your 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 um, your main things that you should be focusing on and pl placing a premium on when writing these essays is being extremely transparent and being honest and having your vote, your voice and only your voice shining through. So so proofread having somebody proofread to actually like go and edit and like kind of incorporate their own perspective into your writing is not the point. The point is, is that a lot of people this is just. We, we all go wrong with this, or, or many of us do, is that when we're writing something and we're so close to it, you know, especially in these essays, we're talking about ourselves, right? We have this tendency to assume, and this is not just essays, this is also when we're talking to people, we have this tendency to assume, ah, that person knows what I'm talking about. That person gets it. I don't have to fully go into, into the details. And so actually, I'm not, and I'm not picking on you, um, Manuel, is, is, do, am I getting your name right? Man, yes, ma'am. Okay, perfect. perfect. Okay. I'm not picking on you, but I want to use you as an example. So you recall I asked you, can you elaborate on that? Can you can you tell me what you're what you mean? I think I know, but I want you to give me a little bit more detail. So in that situation right there, that's where a lot of us also go wrong in other sorts of conversations. When somebody asks us a question, especially somebody that doesn't know us, we might just give kind of the bare minimum answer and assume, yeah, they, they get it. They understand. And that's not always the case um, with our friends. You know, I have very good intuition and I and I have a pretty good idea, especially when I'm dealing with my friends or my family member. OK, yeah, I know what they're talking about. They don't have to fully explain themselves. But when you are in a professional setting or when you are applying to college and people who you have never met before are reading your words or when you're interviewing with somebody, you have to be sure to fully express your thought never assume that they get it never assume that they understand never assume that they are in your head and can read your mind because quite frankly they cannot um and so that's a reason that you want to have somebody who knows you or even somebody that may, maybe doesn't know you to read your essay before you submit it to, to college application um to college admissions committees and scholar admissions admissions committees so that you can say hey what is the take home message that you are getting from my essay? You know, what kind of um, leadership qualities or what sort of just character qualities in general are you, um, can you tell that I'm expressing about myself? Because when you get so close to your essay, you you kind of miss that stuff and you can't, you, you it's, it's hard for us to take that step back and say, let me imagine that I am somebody else reading my essay. We're only reading it through our eyes only and we can't kind of from that work. That's why it's, you can have other people read it and say, mm, is that what you were trying to say? Because that's not what I got. Maybe you should change your wording um, here. Maybe you should change your wording there. Also, just I know that I said make sure to fully, fully explain yourself, um, you know, and never assume that somebody's just in your head. But there's also kind of a catch 22 with that that I want to, to reiterate on this note of communication is that, you know, when you're in an interview setting or when you are writing an essay and you have a word count or, you know, you're on a time crunch or something like that. You know, you want to make sure that your answers at the same time are going to be concise, that you're not just going in circles and repeating yourself, right? You're you're explaining and you're providing detail, but you're being 
very meticulous about how you're doing it and you're being selective and you're not just like rambling, right? There's there's a difference between rambling and just providing um, non-essential information versus providing essential information that um, adds something to what you're saying um, and, and that enhances the, the communication in some way. So never ramble and just, you know, be saying some random stuff. Um, so that's kind of my note on that. Another thing that I want to um, get into in regards to essays is just knowing um, that your essays should have some sort of central theme that they are helping advance, right? Your essays should, you know, your, your, your application overall needs to tell a story, right? We're going back to that idea of, are you a stat or are you a story? So, so what is your story? Are you a leader? Are you somebody who is very compassionate and, and really cares about helping, you know, people that may not be as fortunate as you, or, um, are you somebody that is really into STEM? Like you just love coding what is your story F figure it out and, and 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 it's okay we're you know you guys are 18 now you're you're still 18 you're 17 turning 18 um you know you're, you're still figuring it out you're still trying to understand who you are but but just know that at the end of the day your essays should communicate some sort of compelling story and you're supposed to connect the dots between them right you don't want to just have these random scattered parts to your application where your reader is just very confused as to what you were like, who you what you're standing for right you can have you can talk about hey i was a leadership in in this setting during the summer of xyz i was a leadership at, at, during this school club the story there is that you're a leader right versus you know just talking about all of these random things and the dots not being connected that makes it very puzzling um for the reader and and, and hard for them to just really grasp what you're saying so making sure to think about that um kind of goes along this line of of coherency and just making sure that what you are communicating and a sentence right if i just start and you probably like why did she just stop exactly that was not a very coherent sentence the, the message was lost you're confused because i'm not the dots i just stop halfway between and it's like well, what else? What are, you, what are you trying to tell me here, right? So connecting the dots and going from the first, you know, the subject of the sentence all the way until that final punctuation is extremely, extremely um, important. So there's a there's a metaphor for you. Um, so yeah, that's, that's kind of my point on um, essays. One more thing I want to touch on, um, and I believe this was Destiny who up, and I want to, to kind of address this is just being unique. Destiny, do I have that right? Was that you who um, who said you just kind of want to stand out? Yes. Okay, cool. Um, so yeah, I appreciate you bringing that up because there is this fine, fine line that you want to walk in your essays. And that is how can I present myself in the most favorable light and, and draw attention to these qualities that allow me to, to set myself apart from my competition and show, hey, I deserve this spot. I deserve this money more than the next guy. But also sort of balancing that with, um, you know, not seeming like you are um, arrogant, right? It, 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 this, there's this thing called, and I, this is definitely an oxymoron, but it's called the humble brag right so you are you're you're showcasing yourself and you're putting your best foot forward and and you're making people feel like man i i, I just love this applicant i'm i'm really compelled to meet them but you're doing it in a very humble sort of of way right um and so like i said it, it's an art to it but the thing is is like showing that you're confident you know when you're in an interview setting when somebody asks you hey you know what are your strengths and what are your weaknesses being honest showing that you're human and that you're not acting like i'm just some infallible god like that's not what people want to see people want to see hey this person is self-aware this person knows this is what makes them great this is what makes them special but they also know hey these are the things I need to improve on. And this is how I'm working towards that. So being extremely honest, um, but also just putting your best foot forward and, and not coming across as arrogant and, hey, I'm the latest and greatest. And, you know, anyone who passes up the opportunity and invest in me is going to feel regretful. Like you, you don't want to be communicating in that sort of way because that's just a turn off. Um, also, just making sure that, you know, you're making your writing interesting, that you're holding your reader captive. Right. You want to make sure that they just they're 
they want to eat your words, right? They just want to, you know, they, they don't want to take their eyes off the page. That's how interesting um, your writing needs to be, especially because think about how many applications are passing their desk all day long. You want to make sure that when yours comes, they are like, whoa, like, let's stop the clock, people. This right here is a winner. That's that's the type of stuff you want people to be, um, you know, thinking when you when you get to your um, when they get to your application. Um, so that's kind of what I have for you on um, college and scholarship application uh, essays. I have a lot of information that I want to get through today. So we're going to transition to the next portion of this. And I'll leave some time. Anything to turn to, just make sure to make a quick note of it um, on a piece of paper or on your laptop, and, and we'll definitely make sure to, to, to get that uh, addressed. So next thing I want to get into is the wonderful, wonderful interview process, which I don't know if that's really happening um, now in the age of COVID. I actually kind of want to hear from you guys. What's been the whole interview situation? Are y'all doing like Zoom My stuff or yeah, just somebody jump in. Mine has been like virtual on Zoom. Okay. Okay. Awesome. Awesome. And I'm sure that's been probably kind of tough too. It's just, you know, you can't really read somebody as well when it's virtual, right? Not unless they have that extroverted personality. I mean, yeah, that's that's definitely true. But it's also hard to, because some of the, the body language things that I'm going to be getting into is like, it's hard to really make eye contact with somebody on a computer. Like right now, I'm trying to like, like look at you guys or like look at the computer. And then also like I have the camera up here. It's just all a very strange, um, very strange setup. But yeah, I know that interviews are a, an extremely um, essential part of the college application process. I mean, when I say essential, like, I mean, it's not a maker or breaker sort of deal. Like I didn't even do an interview for Duke and I still got in here. They didn't ask me for one. Um, and I was kind of bitter about that at the time, but is what it is. Um, so anyways, yeah, but interviews are something that's not just essential for college. It's not just a component of that, but it's also a component of applying for a job, right? You know, there's a screening process that goes into really every facet of life. So applying for a job, um, even you might get to a point where once you have a job, you might be the interviewer, right? So when the new spring chicken comes on the block and they're looking for a job and you're already the head honcho, you might have to interview them. And so there are probably going to be some key things that you are looking for. So let's sort of dive into that process and, and how this sort of aspect of verbal communication comes into play, right? So we just talked about written expression. Let's kind of jump into that. So the, the purpose of an interview, can somebody um, tell me, what's the purpose of that and how maybe what kind of similarities do you see between an interview and these essays that you're you're um submitting um you um, ask that question again yeah yeah what's the purpose of an interview and maybe that purpose has some similarities between, you know, the essays that you're submitting um, and, you know, when you're actually doing an interview, what, like, what's the purpose of them and, and how does that purpose compare to essays that you're writing about yourself? What'd you say, Lucy? I don't know if you can hear her. Can you hear her? I'm trying. I'm trying. Can she say it again? Speak up a little bit. We're telling, um, like, telling about ourselves in both, in the interview and in the essay. Bingo. Yes, that is perfect. You hit right on the nose. You hit it right on the nose. So, yeah, per the purpose of an interview is to say, is to prove who you say you are. Right? So, um, what, what was, what, what's the name, what's your name, the one that just responded to me? Ulysses. Ulysses? Did you say yes. That? Perfect. Perfect. Okay, so just like Ulysses said, in the essays and in the interviews, you're talking about who you are, right? But the interview is usually going to be that, that next step. Usually phase one of some sort of screening process is turning in an application, turning in a resume, right? Do, doing that written expression of who you are. Then when they bring you in, they're already interested, right? And now it's your time to sort of walk the talk, kind of walk the walk, right? So whatever you've walked the talk, walk the walk, what, what, whatever the point I'm getting at here is that the stuff that you write in your essay, they're bringing you in to say, okay, is this person 
actually um, who they say they are. They're, they're talking about these leadership abilities. They're talking about being service oriented. But when I see them in person, are they somebody who is gregarious? Are they somebody who is social? Are they somebody who can hold a conversation or are they, you know, are they kind of socially inept? And I don't know who was coming out during these essays, but they're, they're, there doesn't really seem to be a lot of alignment in terms of the person I read about in the essay and the person I'm seeing in person. So they want to make sure that that those two pieces sort of um, meld together and that they fit, right? So in an interview, a lot of the time, the first question that you will be asked is, so tell me about yourself, right? And that, ugh, that is the worst question ever because I'm sometimes, like sometimes I just get caught off guard and I'm like, huh? Like, like th there's just so much. Like, what do you want to know? You want to know about my family? You want to know about my school history? You want to know about like my extracurriculars? What is it that, that you want me to tell you about? And so I just want to hear from, from you guys when somebody asks you that question. So tell me about yourself. What do you usually, what's kind of your, your gut instinct to, how do you respond? I usually tell them about my personality. Okay. So you say your personality traits? Yes. Okay. That's that's a great way of approaching it. Other people have a different approach or a similar approach. I do the same. Like I start talking about myself and my characteristics. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that's definitely a way of going about it. Well, you know, I'm somebody who is intellectually curious. I'm extremely hardworking. I, you know, whenever I'm given a task, I, I put 110% of my effort. So there are multiple ways to address this question. Um, sometimes I, it just really depends on the opportunity that I'm applying for. That's how I sort of shape um, my response. So if I'm talking about, if I'm applying for a job and they bring me in and they say, so tell me about yourself. What I'm probably going to do is kind of like you guys just said, highlight those qualities that I possess and then connect that. And, and also maybe even talk about some of the experiences I've had and then connect that to what makes me a good fit for the position. So not just say, Hey, I'm a hard worker, but yeah, I'm a hard worker. And that's how that would benefit me in a setting like this. Um, and that's what I would bring to the table. And that's how I would enhance this, this working environment. Or, you know, if I'm applying for, um, uh, I just went, did an interview the other day and I have one this week. I'm applying for this all female, um, Baldwin, it's called the Baldwin scholarship program. And what they're looking for is people who are, um, self-aware and who are catalysts for social change. And so when they said, so tell me about yourself, what I talked about was, okay, this is an experience that I just had during my gap year. And then connecting that to how, you know, when I identify some sort of problem in the world, this is the action that I take. And, and this is how, you know, I bring about change. And then also talking about, you know, some of those qualities that I possess to, to, to demonstrate that, hey, I'm, I'm also self-aware. So kind of connecting that to whatever that they're looking for. But at the same time, you want to make sure, just like I said earlier, and this, this goes back to the whole communication thing, is do not ramble. OK, so when you're going into an interview, you can bet your bottom dollar they're probably going to ask you. So tell me about yourself. So I would prep a response ahead of time. Now, I'm not saying be rehearsed, not saying you need to be reciting something from memory because that's just not going to go over well. But you should have a general idea of the points and the trajectory that you're going to follow when you give what I like to call your personal elevator pitch right in an elevator pitch. It's called an elevator pitch because how long are you usually in an elevator with somebody? less than a minute, right? So 30 to 45 seconds when you're going from floor two to floor four, if somebody says, hey, tell me about yourself. You're going to have to already know what you're going to be saying and you need to have it in short, concise form. So do not ramble, already have an idea of what you're going to be talking about, your elevator pitch. Now, um, kind of on that same note, just throughout the interview, not just as it pertains to the elevator pitch, but you want to be very mindful of how long you are talking. And so hopefully I've been doing a, a good job of this so far. I can't really see you guys, so it's a little bit hard um, for me to tell. But usually what I like to do is when I'm communicating with somebody or, or I'm in a presentation sort of setting, I like to take temporary, like, you know, um, I like to take breaks on interval or, you know, check in with the audience on occasion. That's why I've been asking you guys to, to, to participate to make sure that I haven't, you know, lost you guys. It's unfortunate that I can't see you guys in the room, so I can't see if you're like half asleep on me or working on something else. I'm just going to have to give you guys the benefit of the doubt. Um, but the same thing applies in, in an interview or just a normal conversation. You want to make sure 
that you are not just talking for five minutes straight. They've asked you one question. And you're just like, yeah, and blah, 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 blah. And yeah, yeah, yeah. Also this and also that. And like, they're just looking at you like, uh, so like, am I going to get an opportunity to, to talk or to respond back? You want to make sure that you're checking in with the person, right? And also monitoring their body language. If they're like doing this while you're talking to them, looking up and like not even paying attention to you anymore, it's probably a good sign that you've been talking too long and you may need to say, hey, did, you know, I would not necessarily that I lose you or um, do you have any questions about what I just said? Or I want to give you a chance to respond now. So then there's, those are some of the things, you know, when I just met with my teacher the other day, I said, um, so I know I just said a lot, uh, but I want to give you a chance to jump in and kind of give me your input at this point. Um, and so inviting them to say that, or sometimes when I'm on the phone i say have i lost you i know i've been talking for a while um and i haven't heard anything so just want to make sure that that we're, we're still on the same page here so just checking in and, and especially doing that when you can't see the person um same thing goes in an interview setting that i've been saying this whole time is making sure to provide just enough details to establish context right the interviewer is not in your head at all so if somebody says you know what is a time that you were and this was just a question that i was just asked the other day so that's why i'm bringing this up if somebody says talk about a time that you were really uncomfortable well i'm not going to just say uh yeah i was uncomfortable when i volunteered in latin america at 14 years old and i was away from home for four weeks that, like that's not a very um detailed answer you're probably gonna you never want to leave the person hanging like uh i, I want more like and, and i say that because there's this kind of a double entendre here so you want to leave them hanging in the aspect of i want more of this person they've given me so much already and i just i want to see them now i want to kind of take things to the next level that's how you want to leave them more leave them wanting more not in the aspect of um they didn't even like really fully address my question do they even want to be here you know they didn't take the time to fully spell things out for me a to z so providing context you know so when i'm answering that question yeah i volunteered in latin america this is why i was uncomfortable you know we had to take really cold showers i was sleeping on the floor um you know i had to speak spanish for four weeks straight and did not have anybody there to speak english i didn't have technology i couldn't call my parents so providing those details um but also at the same time never losing sight of the question right so kind of when i'm talking to you guys right now i, I go off quote unquote on a tangent or I'm, I'm kind of going down this line but i always make sure to come back to what's the point that i started at right so when you're talking about what's something that made you uncomfortable never just want to string them out and not come back full circle and say so yeah this is why that was a time that, that i was uncomfortable or xyz kind of tie it all together never um like when you're giving somebody a christmas gift you want to make sure that the bow on top is is completely tied and everything is packaged nicely you don't want to just give them kind of this this um this half done package right other things um that you want to just communicate during your interview or that are just important for you to express um is like I said, communication is more than just verbal and written. It's about the way you carry yourself. It's about your body language. It's about um, how you are presenting yourself. And so some ways that you can be successful on that presenting yourself front is by arriving early, right? Now, I'm not saying get there an hour early. You don't want to do all of that. Don't want to be too overzealous, but 10 to 15 minutes is fine. You just definitely don't want to be showing up late. Um, and my, kind of my motto with that is, you know, early is on time, on time is late, and late, unacceptable. So maybe you should adopt that motto as well. Um, bringing your resume to the interview, um, just potentially if, if your person is unprepared and they don't really know kind of what trajectory to follow during the interview, that could kind of give them some, some point of reference about who you are and kind of some of the things that they could ask you about. Obviously wearing professional attire. So, um, you know, not showing up to your interview in sweatpants and your pajama shirt like that. That's probably not going to go over well. Right. You want to make sure that you're showing the person you're communicating to the person that you're interested in the opportunity and that you really care about it. Right. Maybe that means, ladies, you know, I'm not the biggest fan of, of throwing on makeup and, and lipstick, but, you know, my mom always. She's, she's always like, Mackenzie, it doesn't hurt. Like, just put on a little bit of something, something just to like show that you care, show that you've cleaned up a little bit. So those are the times I, I pull out all the stops and and try to look like, a you know, I, I try to be comfortable, but, you know, for interviews and professional things like that, you want to make sure that you're putting your best foot forward, right? And taking it seriously. Um, other things that, that you want to, to be mindful of during your interview is saying things like, 
Um, um, like, uh, yeah, yeah, like, 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 um, um, like we, we teenagers love to do that a lot. And especially during our conversations, you know, I can't even count how many times we say like, 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 or um, 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 during an interview, you want to be extremely mindful of those things. And if you have the inclination to say that, or if you feel like it's coming out, just stop, just pause, right? Don't say, um, just, just pause. It doesn't hurt to just be silent for a minute. Uh, the other thing that I want to say is seeking clarification if you do not understand a question. So some things, like sometimes uh, when the interview is asking you something like, tell me about yourself. P perhaps you want to ask, well, what do you mean? Well, is there specific information that you want to know? Would you like me to tell you about my family? Would you like me to tell you about my experiences? Clarifying. If they say, no, I'm just leaving it open-ended, then you know. But that also goes for other questions that you are asked during the interview. If, if you're just confused about what they want from you, you don't have to just start listing things. Just clarify. It never hurts to do that to make sure that you are on the appropriate track. Another thing uh, that I want to just make sure that you guys are mindful of is just being perceptive of the vibe that your interviewer is giving off. So case in point here, you guys can probably tell that I'm very extroverted. I love talking. I love just like connecting with people. And that's how I am during an interview setting. If I were to be interviewing one of you guys, I would be peppy just like this, right? But you're not going to get an interviewer um, that has my level of energy all the time. Just the other day, I had somebody who was just very, very, she had a poker face the whole time. She was just like looking at me and I could not read her at all. She was just like, I would try to make a joke or something. And she was just like, just staring at me. And I was, luckily I got called back for the interviewer. So apparently I was doing the right thing, but it was just very hard to read. So what I'm trying to get at here is if you are being interviewed by somebody who is very reserved and very uh, just, very low key and, and kind of subdued, I tend to taper my energy a little bit and say, okay, I don't want to scare this person with just how energetic and how passionate I can be. So let me take it down a little bit and, and not be as, I, I still can be passionate, but, but also be um, just a little bit more collected and more controlled and not be so over the top with my energy. On the other hand, if I have somebody that's kind of like me, we can both like laugh and, and get a little quote unquote rowdy together. Not that I'm just like chumming it up with the interviewer, but you, you just have to monitor your energy level and, and read the other person so that you know how to, to present yourself in the best light. Because sometimes people are just not always going to be the most receptive to high energy. They can perceive that as a little bit overbearing. Um, another thing that I want you guys to just be really mindful of is your own body language, right? So making sure that, you know, during the interview, you're, you're sitting up straight, you are looking and making eye contact during Zoom and Microsoft Teams interviews. I can understand how that can be very tough because like I tend to be looking at the person on the screen and it looks like I'm looking down um, instead of like at the camera where you can like, it looks more like I'm making eye contact at that point. Um, but when you're in an in-person interview, it's very easy to tell where the person's eyes are, obviously. So just making sure that you're looking at the person, that you are slightly leaning in a little bit to show, yeah, I'm engaged, I'm listening, I'm paying attention, that you are, you know, I'm sure that you guys have had this experience whenever you're giving a presentation to somebody, or maybe even Ms. Carp can say this, you know, when she's teaching, when students are nodding their head or just giving some sort of subtle communication via their body that they are understanding and that they're following along that is encouraging to the person that's speaking to the person that's presenting it it makes them feel better like okay this person is 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 listening to me and they, they're getting it they, they're understanding right so doing that as well when the person is is talking back to you and asking you a question and, and nodding your head or maybe explaining something about their experience you don't need to be like this like nodding and being very um you know kind of obnoxious about how you're doing it, but just subtly and naturally, obviously, you know, that stuff should just come out, um, you know, but just being mindful of that as well. You also just want to make sure that you are 
having like you're smiling, right? You're you having inviting facial expressions. I sometimes have an issue with when I'm really intently listening to somebody, I tend to do this with my eyebrows. I like crunch them together and it looks like I'm frowning, but I'm not. I'm just really, really paying attention. And I just have a really bad habit of doing that. Otherwise I'm like smiling and, and whatever. Uh, but just also being mindful of that as well, you know, that you're not frowning at the person and that, that your facial expressions are, are warm and inviting and um, just allow the person to feel comfortable. You would want the same thing for you. If, if an interviewer was looking at you like this, you'd probably be like, oh, well, maybe I just said something wrong, did, did I? Right, so you, you wanna make sure that you're kind of giving them that same courtesy. And also just being mindful of, of nervous behavior. So, you know, I tend to, to gesture a lot with my hands, that helps me communicate, but you don't want to be doing this and like, you know, having hand gestures that don't really match what you're saying. Like, yeah, I had a really big house and I had a really small yard and like just doing all of these like random gestures that don't, your words aren't matching what you're doing and you're just kind of like being weird about where your hands are placed you know that that stuff should just come very naturally uh but just just be mindful of that as well and i and on the note of just communicating with your body some people have nervous tics you know right we might put our ladies we might do this with our hair or um you know we might be twirling our hair or even guys might have the same thing or we might just be like nervously tap you can't see me under the table but um i'm at my desk and i'm like nervously twitching my my leg right now like for example you could be doing that um so Things, things like that, just being very mindful of what sort of cues you're giving off. You never want to let another person see you sweat. Uh, so fake it till you make it, so to speak. Uh, and if you know that you're a nervous twitcher, lock your hands together. Or if you know that you're a nervous leg shaker, cross your legs. Don't, don't, don't give the interviewer any sort of sign that you are uncomfortable. You got to be confident and you have to communicate that confidence, not just with your tone, but with your voice, I mean, with your body language, not just with your tone and your voice, but with your body language as well. Last thing I want to touch on with interviews, this is very, very important. So pay attention here. I need you to listen and not just hear. And that is come with questions. Just as interested as they are in you, you must demonstrate that you reciprocate that interest. And so what I mean by that is come with things that you're genuinely curious about. What do my responsibilities entail on this job? Or, you know, if you're interviewing somebody with, with somebody that's a, a previous alumni of Duke or wherever you're applying, asking them, what was your experience like at Duke? What, what was your transition like? Or, you know, how did Duke prepare you to go into, you said you were a lawyer, how did Duke prepare you for that transition into law school or X, Y, Z? But coming with questions that are not, that coming with questions, period, and also taking it to another level of coming with questions that are thought provoking, right? Don't just ask somebody a question that you can literally Google. Okay. So if you know that the acceptance rate of XYZ school is X percent, do not come to the interview and ask the person, so what's the acceptance rate of this university? That's just going to turn the person off. They're going to be like, it's, it's on the website. Um, you know, you can, you can, I, you can look at that. You can just go do a simple Google search. So come with things that are, that are thought provoking. I mean, that show that you, that you genuinely care about things beyond the superficial, what's on the surface, right? Uh, and the last thing I want to touch on is thank you notes. Too many people, especially our generation, we just, we aren't old fashioned. We don't like to send nice, you know, thank you letters or thank you emails. But I'm telling you, going back to what Destiny talked about earlier, we want to make sure that we are keeping it professional and that we can differentiate ourselves from our competition by going that extra mile, by sending that thank you note, thanking somebody for their time. And so what I mean by that is there, there's also a fine line that you have to balance with this. So usually I'll ask the person for their business card or their email or whatever. I won't tell them that I'm sending them a thank you note, but hey, you know, I want to keep you posted on, like if it's for a college interview, hey, I want to keep you posted on whether I get admitted. I thank you for your time right now, blah, blah, blah. And then I, I have their business card at that point because I said I want to keep in touch. And then after the fact, not the next day, usually the same day, probably within that, you know, maybe an hour of speaking to them, uh, sending them a quick, hey, I appreciate your time today. You know, I really enjoyed hearing about X, Y, Z, whatever. Keep making it personal, but also not making it chummy. You never want to look like you are 
pardon my language here, but like kissing somebody's butt, that doesn't make anybody feel good. If you're just like, yeah, I just like really, really appreciated it. And you are so kind and you're so nice. That just looks a little fake and syrupy, right? So making sure that you're professional and that your courtesy that you have, that you're demonstrating courtesy and that you are genuinely appreciative, but not being chummy and syrupy and just being a little over the top. You don't, you, you want to stray away from that. So that, that means your thank you letter or email or whatever should not be like a paragraph, right? A few sentences will, will suffice. Uh, and just making sure that you keep that at the back of your mind. Now, the next thing that I would like to get into is, um, yes. I had a question. Yes, please. So, um, like, I've been told, like, I'm, I'm part of this, um, it's this organization, right, that helps us with um, college applications and college admissions and stuff. Yes. And they told us um, to try our best to, like, be as um, engaged as possible into um, the college that we're really interested in, like, go to as many interviews as possible, go to make as many um, information sessions, maybe go to a college tour if that's possible. Yeah. So um, what I'm wondering is um, I've done, like, a few info sessions and like like the people were really engaging and stuff right and um i really liked the way that they were presenting and everything mm -hmm. so um apart from interviews can we like send that thank you letter to them or is it like that's not really necessary or maybe that's not as appreciated as interview um thank you letters or i yeah. want you to know this is a really great question andrea and i thought provoking so look at you already already <laughs> What I would say for that is it depends. So if you're going to something like a, because I, I'm just thinking back to my time where I was going to these college workshops and there were like thousands of us in the room and, you know, we have these presenters and yeah, like I really enjoy, like I really enjoyed the way they presented, but they don't know who I am. Definitely. You don't need to send a thank you note in that case. But if you are, perhaps you're in that setting thousand people are there uh, and this is obviously not in COVID times folks because we ain't doing that anymore um but perhaps after the presentation they they do breakout sessions and you actually get a chance to speak to the person and you have a, a really good 10 15 minute conversation and you guys are vibing you know you're doing your thing they give you their business card they're like man like best of luck like keep me posted and you, you you'll be able to read if, if you had a connection with that person yeah then send a thank you note, right? That that would be appropriate in that case, and that would be appreciated. Uh, another thing I would say is also it depends. Like if you're in a in a breakout session of twelve people, like the inner the the presentation doesn't happen with a thousand, but instead it's in a tiny room where uh, some sort of representative comes to your school, meets with you and your classmates, and it's just ten of you guys, and and they kind of interact with all of you, and maybe they know your name, maybe they didn't, but it was still a very small, intimate session. I would still send a thank you note in that case as well because that is appreciated uh so those are i hope that answers your question a little bit but also just doing what feels natural and putting yourself in the interviewer's shoes as well because if you were giving a presentation to a thousand kids and you just get this like random thing i mean yeah that'd probably make you feel good but you'd also probably be like man i i don't really know this person so it's kind of hard for me to like even put a face to the name or, or anything like that you, you know what i'm saying mm -hmm. yeah Thank you. So, yeah, yeah, it does answer the question. Yeah, yeah, that was a, that was a great question, and and I, I appreciate you asking that. Uh, any other questions? Let's just take like a little little pause right now. Um, kind of a more than halfway through, but but still. Um, anybody else have anything on their mind? Okay. That sounds good. Um, so thank you for that question, Andrea. We're going to keep on a truck in here. Uh, and what I would say now is kind of what I want to get into. What does communication look like in college, right? So on this aspect of particip participation in, in college, kind of what my experience has been thus far, and you guys have probably seen this you know when you're applying you know there's this there's this tenant uh, there's this value this premium that is placed on students being intellectually curious students stimulating discussion right and so now I uh, here I am representative of Duke University I can give you a little insight into is, is this true is this really what they want here um, and so real talk 
answer to that is it depends on the class, right? If we're in chem class, which I'm not in chem class, but you know, I have some buddies who are in there, and especially in the age of COVID, it's hard. You know, we're not going to have some insightful, really intellectually stimulating, most likely discussion on the, you know, different reactions or, you know, things like that. Your teacher's going to be talking to you, teaching you the content. You ask your question if you don't understand and you move on with your business and and you kind of get through the day. Now, in the, in the classes that I'm taking, I'm in humanities based classes. Uh, so two of mine are uh, have to do one of them is about civic engagement and social change. And the other one is about uh, inequity in the education system. And so in those classes, I come and they're very, very heavily discussion based, so much so that 25% of my grade is actually Am I engaged during class? Am I, you know, raising my hand and, and having insightful things to the, bring to the table? When I raise my hand, am I demonstrating that I have done read done the reading before I show up to class? Because usually we have, you know, different assignments that we have to complete before we come to class. And it's not like we're going to be graded on them or, or assessed, but the expectation is that you do your reading and that you come to class and you be ready to contribute and kind of ground your arguments in the stuff that we were assigned as reading. So, so demonstrating that as well um, when you are, are speaking up in class. But at the same time, even knowing that 25% of my grade is based on participation, there are some different, and, and this is actually something that was explicitly gone over in my classes, just some, some conversation, uh, conversation tips and strategies to keep at the forefront of your mind when we're, we're having these dialogues. And so just so that you guys can be ahead of the curve and, and cur ahead of the curve. And so that, um, you know, maybe in your classes now, you can start incorporating these values into your, to your learning process is something called deep listening, right? So we already kind of went through that, that differentiation between listening and hearing. But when we talk about deep listening there, there's a little bit more to it. And that is having a clear headspace. Right? When you come to class, you come to class just to be engaged in the material that we're covering in that subject. And this is something that's really hard for me because I always have a lot going on. I have my, my little, this is my sub, this is like all the stuff I have to do for the week. I have it planned out to the hour, Monday through Friday. And so I always have things that I'm thinking about. I'm like, okay, what's the next thing I have to do? Oh yeah, I have French after this. Oh yeah, I have this assignment that I need to complete between this transition, blah, blah, blah. And what's really important is that when you're having a conversation with somebody, when you're you're participating in class, that you are fully focused on what that person is saying. So you don't have all of these conflicting things in your head that are that are distracting you and you know taking your your attention away from them. Uh, so just keeping that in mind, and then also being somebody who listens just to listen and not with the intent to respond. And what I mean by that is, especially if you're in some sort of debate or argument with somebody, listen to their argument, listen to what they're saying. Don't just be so gung ho about your own perspective and what you believe that you're just like, I don't give a crap about what you're telling me. I'm just gonna tell you what I have to say. And it might not even address the point that you just brought up. Like, don't don't have that mentality, right? You wanna make sure that you're you're just, listening to what the person is saying and then crafting your response after you have absorbed and processed what you have just heard okay next thing is speaking up and stepping back that means that even though i know 25 percent, 20 to 25 percent of my grade is based on communication based on participation based on engagement that doesn't mean every time somebody asks a question the teacher says something i'm going to raise my hand Right. One, I'm only going to raise my hand when I have something insightful to say, when I have something meaningful to bring to the table. Right. I'm not going to just raise my hand. and It's like, OK, McKinsey, that's like very common sense. Like, why did you even say that? Uh, and I'm also not going to hog the conversation. Right. There are some people in my class who I know are a little bit more introverted, who I know need some time to warm up to the conversation. And I don't want to just be, you know, if any of you guys play sports, who likes the ball hog? Nobody. You got to be a team player. Got to make sure that you're stepping up. You're doing your part. You're carrying your weight, but you're also stepping back and leaving room for other people to get involved and for other people to share, you know, their perspective and their viewpoint. So being respectful of that as well, speaking up and stepping back and just being very mindful of that. And the last thing I want to touch on uh, in regards to participation in college, uh, there's actually two more things, is apologizing for, and I want you guys to pay attention to this, apologizing for impact not 
intent. And so what I mean by that, I'm gonna say it again, apologize for impact, not intent. And so what that means is if you say something and maybe you didn't think it through before you said it and your intent, you had good intentions, but the way it came out, maybe it was offensive to somebody. Don't just be defensive and be like, well, that's not what I meant. I didn't mean to uh, you know, offend you. You know, it, I, it was coming from a good place. The point is, is that it hurts somebody's feelings. The point is, is that, you know, you, that person is upset now. And even though your intentions were in the right place, somebody is still hurt. And so apologizing for the impact that you've had on them, regardless of whether your intent behind it was positive or good natured. Okay. Uh, and the last thing I want to touch on, this is the last thing I want to touch on in regards to participation in college. And that is, and this goes to now as well, really any academic setting, even when you get into the workforce, there are no stupid questions. Okay. Like literally if you don't understand something, even if you feel like, and like, I'm going to look like an idiot if I raise my hand right now, guaranteed hundred percent, there's at least one other person in the room who's feeling the exact same way as you. And it's just too afraid, uh, to speak up, right? And so do it for the both of you. But the thing is, is your teacher, your boss, your peer is never gonna be upset with you if you ask and make sure that you're doing it correctly versus if you just operate, you go into the test, you go into the task and you do it wrong because you were afraid to ask. Never is there a stupid question, right? Make sure to get clarification, make sure that you understand uh, and never never apologize for that, right? Just make sure that you, you have an understanding so that you can put your best foot forward. Now, as we're, our time together is winding down, there are a few more things that I want to touch on and that is kind of what writing assignments look like in college. So I'm gonna kind of give you guys an outline of what, what the last things we're gonna be touching on here in our last 13 or so minutes before I open it up to questions from you guys. And that's going to be what are writing assignments looking like in college? What does it mean to, to build rapport with teachers? And then also kind of what to expect in the work field. So I'm going to make this as quick as possible uh, so that we can kind of open it up to questions, but still make sure to give you guys good information. So expectations for writing assignments in college. So kind of what my experience has been so far is that my major essays are either research assignments or reflective assignments. So by research, I'm talking academic writing. I'm talking real um, official, real technical, real knowledge based uh, grounded in the literature right and then you have your reflection assignments that's real narrative based uh you know you incorporating your own feelings and experiences and kind of connecting that to the context um into the content in some sort of way and so just some general things um that i've like learned and then have to sort of sort of had a learning curve in regards to is just like your tone and research assignments are going to be very different from your tone and reflection assignments right and that's probably common sense maybe um, but I'm somebody that uses a lot of figurative language. Um, and so like I had to um, learn very quickly that you know, figurative language is not something that you know you're gonna incorporate into a research assignment where your writing is super technical and you're summarizing research in the field, right? You 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 have to take away that air of subjectivity um, and, and you're purely being objective in these research assignments, purely stating the facts and informing somebody about some sort of topic and assuming that they have no knowledge about it, right? So that, that tone of just being mindful of, are you being subjective in your writing or are you being objective, right? Other things that you just wanna be mindful of when you're doing these research assignments is, or, or just writing assignments in general is paragraph structure, right? This is the same thing when you're speaking to somebody or when you're writing to somebody. Make it easy for the person on the receiving end of your communication signals to follow your train of thought. Start with your main idea. Just like I did with you guys just now, I said, okay, this is what we're gonna be talking about for the rest of the time. You already know what to expect when, you, when you're writing an essay. You have your main idea sentence. Introduce the reader to what you're talking about in this paragraph so that all those details that follow, they know what umbrella topic it is underneath. And it's easier for them to, to follow and kind of comprehend this, um, direction that you are, are going in, right? Also, I'm gonna keep reiterating this, keep reiterating this, keep reiterating this. Never assume that somebody knows what you are saying. Don't just forget it when as soon as we leave today and go back to you assignments or go back to engaging in conversation with somebody and, and forgetting to just 
connect all those dots and, and spell things out from A to Z and making sure that you are very, very articulate and detailed in whatever it is that you're trying to express. And so same thing goes here in college. You know, at Duke, we have this thing called the writing studio. And so we have professionals um, like other upperclassmen who can read our writing and give us feedback um, and tell us how to improve our writing before we actually turn it in. So those are things that you guys want to take advantage of, um, you know, when you guys get to the next level and just having you don't have to have a writing studio to have somebody read your paper and, and give you feedback before you turn it in for the official um, grade. And the last thing is following your rubric. Most likely your teacher is going to give you their expectations. These are the things I want you to cover in your paper. So make sure you do that, right? If your teacher's telling you what they're looking for, make sure to address all of those points. And the easiest way to do that is by before you just jump right in and, and you have your cursor at the beginning of your blank word document, making sure to outline, giving yourself um, some sort of plan, uh, some sort of guidelines to follow as you, um, you you go about your essay so that you don't lose sight of what are the things that all the all the points that you're going to be hitting. So following your rubric and outlining and just kind of getting yourself organized before you just dive right in and, and kind of go on this this um, just kind of get off track and, and kind of go down some random rabbit hole like Alice in Wonderland. Right. So moving on uh, to just building rapport with teachers and what that means and, and really just building rapport with anybody that you are working with. So this starts now, people. This starts when you are, you know, we're, we're you're not halfway through your senior year of high school. So building rapport with your folks right now, the people that are teaching you, your counselors, your administrators, building rapport when you, you get to this next level of college with your professors and also building rapport with your boss or whoever, you know, when you get into the workforce. If you have a job now, right? And so the reason for that, right? Well, what does building rapport even mean, right? What what that entails is actually connecting with the people, right? A lot of us students are under the the false assumption that our teachers are just are robots. They just eat, sleep, and breathe school, and they might even spend the night at school. Unfortunately, that's not the case. And I'm sure Ms. Carp can attest to the fact that she goes home to her family. You know, she has a life outside of the classroom, things that make her tick and things that, you know, get her excited aside from grading you guys' as papers, right? So they're people with passions and interests and, and things that extend beyond the academic arena. And so making sure that you're demonstrating that you not only care about the class and care about being successful, but also that you care about getting to know your teacher and not in a chummy sort of way, right? Like, you know, just showing up and because people can read when it's just fake and it's, it's like, you're just doing it just to be chummy and you're not sincerely interested. But if you see your teacher make some sort of comment about, you know, yeah, I used to have a nonprofit back in the day education and you know you know that you have some sort of passion passion that aligns with what their thing is find common ground and, and talk about it right uh that is a perfect way to get a conversation started and and to to just connect with your teacher outside of things purely academic but making sure that you're not doing it in a in a fake way where it just looks like yeah this person is just trying to get on my good side and i'm not feeling that like nobody appreciates that at all right Making sure that you make yourself known, and that's that's uh, goes along the lines of, of building rapport. And so, what I mean by that is, just especially when your classes are large, you want to make sure that you're more than just a number, more than just a some random name on the attendance roster. You want your teacher to know who you are, and and maybe even have some more information about you that just goes beyond your grade in the class, right? So make sure that your teacher has some sort of connection with you, right? You don't want it to be an insincere connection, but you know, making sure that your teacher has a good idea of, of who you are as a student and that you just establish a, a relationship there. And and perhaps you can do that by going if your teacher has office hours. And, and I know this is not a thing in, in the high school from what I remember, but like here in college, we have time outside of the class to go and meet with our teachers uh, and ask questions or literally my, my psychology teacher just says you can come by and say hi come by and just just talk to me right and so going to that and, and building a relationship with your teacher and genuinely showing that you care that you care about the class that you care about being successful that is going to go a long way trust me right Another way you can build rapport with your teachers is actually discussing feedback on assignments. Just the other day, I got a grade back. I didn't feel like it was reflective of my efforts. I went, I talked to the teacher. I sat down and I said, look, maybe I wasn't communicating myself 
um, most, you know, in the most articulate fashion in this writing. And, and I can understand how you didn't feel like I was connecting the dots, but can I hear your input or, or can you tell me why you put this comment on my paper? Cause I don't really agree with it or whatever. So going and discussing feedback and not just for the sake of asking for a regrade, showing that you care about getting better, that you're not going to just take, you know, some, some bad grade and, and view it as a failure or view it as disappointment, but that you want to make strides in the right direction and get yourself on track. Teachers care a lot about that, right? And you should care a lot about that, right? That should just be genuine, um, genuine desire on your part as well. And, and can I ask input on that. Yes, please. So also, when you take the initiative to ask about your grade or to ask about learning more about the assignment, the teacher is also more likely to reach out to you if you make that same kind of mistake the moving forward, because now they have now they understand the type of person you are and the things you go through. And so they're more likely to reach out to you versus just a, a name on a paper. So I agree with that. And I'm, I'm really glad Miss Miss Carp brought up that point because that's exactly what I was going to be going into. Teachers are more likely to give you the benefit of the doubt. They understand, you know, kind of where you're coming from, and and, and maybe yeah, okay, I, I I understand what McKenzie was trying to say because I already have a relationship built with her, or. They're going to, because they know that you want to succeed, they're going to want to help you succeed. And just like Ms. Carp said, inviting you in for, for that extra discussion or say, hey, like, you know, I know you're better than this. Can, can we, you know, maybe let's work together and, and let me tell you how you can improve on XYZ assignment, um, blah, 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 you know, so that that is the sort of relationship you want to have with your teacher. You want to make sure that you're, you're building that rapport. Um, and on that note, they're also more likely to be a support system for you, not just inside the classroom, but outside of the classroom. And so what I mean by that is, you know, perhaps writing a letter of recommendation for you or even telling you about a particular opportunity or internship or, or summer program that aligns with something that you're interested in. Teachers have connections outside of the classroom. They um, are aware of, of opportunities that, that maybe haven't made it down to uh, kind of made it down to our level or through the counselors or whatever. And, and they might communicate those to you because you've taken the time to get to know them. Right. Um, teachers are also they're more likely and do not take advantage of this, uh, but more likely to perhaps grant you an extension on an assignment if you've taken the time to to demonstrate to them that you really care. And so what I mean by that is usually, and especially in college, there are hard deadlines for things, right? I'm given the syllabus on the first day of school. My first day was August 17th. And the teacher said, hey, these are when all your essays, these are when your tests are taking place, so on and so forth, put them in your calendar, right? But because I had a relationship with the teacher, and I was really having a stressful week, I said, hey, um, I I'm not gonna be able to get this in by XYZ date. And to be honest, I don't really think any of my peers are either. We're all going through, you know, the normal freshman XYZ happening in these classes. And she ended up moving the assignment back an entire week for all of us, right? So like I said, don't take advantage of that potential grace period that you could get from a teacher and don't abuse it. So what I mean by that is if your teacher has given you one free pass, don't just think, okay, well, anytime I'm stressed or anytime I've mismanaged my time, I can just ask and they and I shall receive. No, it doesn't work like that. But like I said, for that one-off time that, that maybe you just, it's just been an overwhelming week and you need those extra three days or whatever, having a relationship and a foundation already established with your teacher perhaps will make it more likely that there'll be a little bit more understanding. Right. So that's the last thing I want to touch on in regards to that. Um, and then the final thing before I open up, open it up to, to Q&A and hopefully you guys will, will participate in that is kind of what to expect when you make it to the workforce and, and how all of these things that I've talked about kind of will tie together. So the thing is, is, you know, you're going to be whether you like it or not, communicating with people for the rest of your life. And so, especially in the workforce, you're going to have these different tiers of, of your network, right? You're going to have your superiors, right? That you're, you know, you're meeting with them and you want to make sure that, you know, when you, you walk into the room with your boss, you're not wasting their time. You're coming, you have a plan for the meeting, you have an agenda, you're articulate, you're expressing yourself appropriately, you're listening to what your boss is saying, but you're also making sure to sort of establish um, some sort of connection with your boss that extends beyond, okay, we purely see each other from nine to five, right? So, so kind of all those things coming into play there. You're also going to be meeting with 
teammates, right? So making sure that you're a good collaborator, that you're that you're organized, that you, like I said, you're coming to these meetings ready to be an active listener to, to what your teammates are, are bringing to the table and you're ready to, to be engaged in dialogue. You're ready to, to step up and also step back. Uh, you're ready to demonstrate with your body language that you're genuinely interested in, that you're attentive in, in the topic, attentive to the topic at hand. You're also going to want to make sure that you are networking with people in the workforce who have, you know, sort of walked this path that you have already navigated and, you know, who are sort of further along uh, on this road to success that you are and, and, and that you are willing to kind of go out of your way to meet with them and, and to perhaps that means do an interview or, or something like that. So all communication and, and whether that's verbal, written, body language are going to be coming into play with all all of those things you're going to be giving presentations for the rest of your life so making sure that all of the things we've talked about today are sticking with you and i i think miss carp recorded this so she'll probably send out the recording to you and you can go listen to my voice for however many times you need to hear it until this advice sticks and also just knowing that communication is also extremely extremely essential when you're sending an email right? You want to make sure you're going to be sending emails for the rest of your life, you know, not just to, you know, your, your peers or, you know, your acquaintances, but also to your superiors, right? And so making sure that you are concise, you're getting straight to the point. Emails are not like text, that you're keeping it professional, right? That you're not asking people too many questions in the email and you're being mindful about, okay, you know, this person is busy. People most likely, they might be skimming my email if it's too long. So let me make it super concise um and and let me just get to this right at the 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 main idea should be established within hi miss carp or hi so and so this is the reason i'm reaching out right not being too chummy and and being too flowery but just getting right to it paying attention to your formatting right like i said never you never want to ramble when you're having a conversation with somebody same extends an email you want to make sure that things are organized that things are you know easy on the eye easy to follow right so how you can do that is by paying attention to your text size whether your paragraphs are broken up in a in an appropriate fashion and you not just have a big block of text on there right paying attention to color you don't need to have a rainbow of text in your emails right also paying attention to tone this is another thing that goes into to email sending making sure that you're polite that you're professional that you're proofreading and not having, you know, errors in your, um, in your, in your email. You're not having figurative language that could be misconstrued because, like I said, regardless of the form of communication that it is, whether it's verbal or written uh, or body language, they're all communicating things about who you are, right? Whether you know you're somebody that's likable, whether you're somebody that's credible, and you want to make sure that your tone in your email demonstrates those things as well that you're not just you know communicating with your teacher or your boss like they're your friend because they're not right uh and then the last thing that i want to say that goes into communication is knowing being selective about what type of communication is appropriate in what context right and so what that means is is it more appropriate to pick up the phone and, and call this person because i have a question or is it more appropriate to send an email, right? So you never want meaning to get lost in, in translation. And so sometimes, you know, if, if I'm trying to plan something out with somebody, I don't want to go back and forth on email. It just takes too long when I can just have a quick 10 minute conversation and we can both be on the same page and move on with our lives. So being extremely uh, selective about what type of communication you use when is also going to be, is also going to serve you well. So on that note, I have, wrapped up my presentation for today for you guys questions now would be a great time to, to pick my brain a little bit before you guys get out within the next seven minutes or so i have a question yes okay i was curious when you said uh you graduated at 16 how did you do that did you skip classes or like how did that process go yeah, I, this is always something that racks people's brain. Uh, but actually, so I went to a Montessori school when I was uh, younger. And, and so I went to kindergarten at three years old instead of five. I never skipped any grades or anything like that. But since kindergarten, I've been um, two years younger than all of my peers up until this year. Now I'm one year younger than my, my peers. I just turned 18 um, on the 17th of this month and my peers are turning 19. But yeah, that's sort of how that that works nothing crazy um but yeah okay thank you yeah
While y'all are thinking about your questions, um, I also wanted to add in um, just at the end where you're talking about your professors. You also when you're asking them, you also don't want to bully them. OK, don't don't um, address them in a way like you deserve extra time or, mm -hmm. uh, you know, don't they they're more likely to help you out when you come with sugar versus what's the other option? I forget. So salt okay because when you when you come and address them as though they're in the wrong and you deserve what you deserve um you will most likely not get the alternative not you know the result that you're seeking okay because i've had professors who when uh students came at them with that kind of energy sorry when they came with, to them with that kind of negative energy, it actually made the entire class suffer because this um, professor decided to give the, the students more work, okay? Because they're allowed to do and teach as they see fit. So you do not want to tell them what, what how they should be treating you and they are not going to accommodate for your work schedule, they're not going to accommodate for your personal lives. Again, especially if you're coming at them in a negative kind of energy. Mm -hmm. That's that's a great point. Your teacher doesn't owe you anything. So just being extremely mindful of that and asking and not demanding, it will go a long way. No questions? I'm not scary, y'all. You can ask. You can ask anything. It doesn't even have to be related to today's topic. If you're just curious about college life or college life in the in the time of COVID, I'm happy to answer anything about that. I have a question. Like, um, was it hard um, getting the transition? Um, like, you know how you say you took a gap yeah, that's a really good question. And I would say it was kind of like a, a weird mix of like two feelings. So I was really, really excited to get back into sort of the academic grind. Uh, but also it kind of showed up that I had been out of practice for a little bit when I was like, oh, I'm having to write a two, four, five, six, whatever, how many page paper. And I haven't like had to write anything. Um, to that caliber in, in a year. So yeah, that was a little bit strange, but at the same time, it was really, really nice to take a break, right? Cause I, I mean, I find it really, really hard in high school. I graduated number two of my class. And so to, to have that time off where I let my mind sort of take a break was really, really um, important, I think, and allowed me to refuel so that I could sort of start out my, my year here with a uh, hit the ground running. And what are you majoring in? So, I won't have to declare until second semester of my sophomore year, but what I'm thinking right now is majoring in cultural anthropology, uh, which is basically just the study of how people interact with their culture and how their culture impacts their thoughts, feelings, behaviors, and then also minoring in education. So if Duke had an education major, I'd be all for it, but unfortunately we don't. So yeah, and then I, I plan on going to law school um, after I leave Duke. So do you plan on becoming a lawyer or a teacher or? Uh, definitely a, a lawyer. Something that I'm, I'm really passionate about is just affecting the academic and educational achievement gap that exists between lower income students of color and, and higher income white students. And so any way that I can sort of address and mitigate that gap through my line of work, uh, potentially just litigating on behalf of a nonprofit or something like that, um, that that's what I want to do with my life. No, I don't I don't want to teach. Uh, but yeah. Oh, that's, good. that's that's amazing. <laughs> hey somebody asking me a question? No, and that is it. They're being dismissed to go to lunch. Okay. So
Yes, um, they're saying thank you. So thank you so much for taking the time out. Yeah, of course. I hope that this was, I know you and um, you and I talked just Carp, kind of about some of the things we wanted to discuss. So I, I hope this was kind of helpful and this is sort of what you had in mind. Um, just so I can make sure I'm on the right track for Wednesday. Yes, this was perfect. So okay. they're already learning different aspects of communication and research. So now they're getting the academic side. So that's great. Awesome. Awesome. Well, I really appreciated my time with, with you guys today. Uh, Y'all were a great group. Um, and hopefully I was I was beneficial. I gave you my website so you can feel free to get a hold of me. I have a contact page on there. But other than that, I, I really appreciated being with you guys today. Okay, thank you. Okay, I'll thank see you. you. Yeah, thank you guys. Have a nice day. Okay, you too. Bye. Hey, don't forget.